Good morning. My name is Phil Adamo. On behalf of President Paul Privenow and Dean Barbara Farley, I'd like to welcome you to the 2012 Humanities and Fine Arts Convocation. Let's have one more round of applause for the musicians. The Oxford Percussion Ensemble. <clears throat> Under the direction of Matthew Barber, we appreciate their uh, performance. The speaker today has asked me to be very brief, uh, not because he's particularly humble, although he's you know, probably more humble than he ought to be, but he has a lot of things to share with you, and so he's told me to keep this introduction short. So here it is, here's the short version. Uh, at various points in his life, Dan Phillips has been a military intelligence officer, a professor of modern dance, a syndicated puzzle maker, an antiques dealer, and he's currently the founder, uh, builder, and main designer of a company called Phoenix Commotion, which makes sustainable housing uh, out of sustainable stuff. And he's gonna tell you more about that today. And uh, please join me in welcoming my friend, Dan Phillips. I'm Dan Phillips. Uh, thank you for being here. This is certainly a privilege to be here uh, in your convocation series. I build houses out of free salvage and recycled materials, and I only hire, in, uh, only hire unskilled workers, and I target single mothers and low-income families and artists. And I have got a few pictures here, and I'll show you what I've been doing. Then uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about how I'm able to do what I do. Uh, and then I'll entertain some questions. So if you would hold some question, any questions you have until the end, um, I'll field them. Uh, there are a lot more photos on my website, which is right up there, uh, if you want to see more photos. And there will be other opportunities to see photos uh, while I'm here. Anyway, this is the first house uh, that I built. It's a little Victorian house. Uh, all those little buttons up there uh, are hickory nuts. And uh, those uh, stained glass windows were headed to the landfill. And as soon as he saw how interested I was, he said, you know, I'm going to have to be paid for those. OK, so I gave him $200 for six units, which is cheap at 25 times the price. Then uh, that double front door with the eyebrow windows and the three light transom, that was headed to the landfill. Probably worth uh, $3,500 as an architectural antique. Even the lock set is probably worth $200. Uh, that has a turret. You can't have a Victorian house without a turret. A little Rapunzel kind of window up there. Um, and all those are short pieces of 2x4 western red cedar, 9 inches long, cut at an angle to produce the radius for the stairs. Um, then uh, those buttons there, those are hickory nuts and on the corbels here. And these larger buttons there, those are chicken eggs. And of course, first you have breakfast. Uh, and then you uh, fill them full of resin and nail them up and paint them and you have an architectural button in a fraction of the time that the marketplace could provide. Uh, this is looking down uh, into the front room. Uh, this is the stairway going up. I got this staircase uh, for $20, including delivery to my lot. <laughs> uh, I can't even buy material for one tread for $20. And if you notice, every one of these balusters are dovetailed into the stair treads. You don't see that anymore. <laughs> this is looking up inside the turret, you notice there are bulges and lumps and pokes and sags. Well, if that ruins your day, you should not live in this house. Got a laundry chute there, and there, right there, is an iron shoe last. Uh, it's one of those cast iron things that look like a shoe uh, that ca Cooper collars use. I had one of those, you see them at antique shops. So I mounted it to some low-tech gadgetry there, and so you stomp on the shoe last, and then the door flies open, and you throw your laundry down there. Uh, and if you're smart enough, uh, the laundry hits that, uh, that basket on top of the washer. If you're not, it goes into the toilet. Uh, then I built a bathtub, uh, and that's out of uh, uh, short pieces of Western Red Cedar and I uh, just had a ring on the floor, this ring right there, and then glued and corbelled and nailed it up to a flat, then flipped it over, then did the two profiles on the end, ground off the, the lumps, filled in the voids with a resin, 
two coats of fiberglass with cloth and two coats of bathtub paint. Tub. And uh, when I first had that ring on the floor, a lady came up and said, what are you going to do there? Oh, I'm going to build a bathtub. <laughs> oh, you're going to put that around a tub. Oh, no. No, that's going to be the tub. And she said, oh, that won't work. So, you know, standard responses, it probably won't. And she looked at me straight and said, it won't. Well, that got my dander up just a little bit, so I was determined to build a tub. And after all, a bathtub doesn't represent great subtlety and nuance. If it holds water, tub. I mean, there's nothing left. You know. uh, and it is uh, the most comfortable tub I've been in. There are little cheek impressions down there where you kind of nestle in, and it's a, it's a two-person tub. Because after all, a tub isn't just a question of hygiene, but there's a possibility of recreation there as well. Uh, <laughs> uh, then this, uh, this faucet here is uh, a piece of uh, Osage orange. It doesn't grow up here, it grows across middle America. It's extremely hard, termites don't eat it, and it doesn't rot. And so it looks a little phallic, but after all, this is a bathroom. Um, then there's a house based on a Budweiser can. It doesn't look like a can of beer, but the design takeoffs are absolutely written, unmistakable. It's red, white, blue, and silver. Then the barley hops design is working up into the eaves here, and the cornice work, and that dental work uh, comes directly off the can, as does the front porch railing. And in Texas, uh, all the Budweiser cans have a Texas star, so you've got to have a Texas star if you're in Texas. Um, then if you'll look on it, you've probably never seen a Budweiser can, but if you look on there, uh, there are these little designs that are kind of Art Nouveau-ish, kind of decorative from the 20s. Uh, I put a can of beer on a copier and kept enlarging it until I got the size I wanted and then cut it out and then nailed it up. And that's what those things are going down the eaves there. Uh, then on the, the Budweiser can, it says, this is, the most, this is the famous Budweiser beer. We know of no other beer. Blah, 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 blah. And so we changed that and said, this is the famous Budweiser house. We know of no other house than by any other carpenter, and so forth and so on. Then uh, somebody gave me the fence to a 1930s shaper, which is this very angry woodworking machine. They gave me the fence, but they didn't give me the shaper. So that's what this is. And so uh, you turn this dial here, and this ram comes across uh, to the front door, and then you lock it down with a lever, and that's the deadbolt. And it'll keep bull elephants out. I promise. <coughs> and sure enough, we've had, had no problems with bull elephants. Uh, this is the downstairs shower. It's intended to simulate a glass of beer. And there are bubbles there going up. And then lumpy tiles at the top to simulate suds. Where do you get lumpy tiles? Well, of course, you don't. But I get a good many toilets. And so if you just dispatch a toilet with a hammer, you get lumpy <laughs> tiles. <laughs> Then uh, got a beer, uh, beer tap for a faucet, and right there, you can barely see it, there's a long neck Budweiser bottle for a toilet paper holder. Then this is going up uh, in the second story. Uh, that leaded glass is the same panel that occurs in every middle class house in America. It's a pretty panel of glass, but we're getting a little bit tired of that. And if you put that in the front door, then your design fails. Say, oh, you're trying to be like those guys, and you didn't quite make it. So, don't put it at the front door. Put it in the stairwell or somewhere else, but not in the front door. And then you breathe life back into that. This is uh, one of those sliding glass patio doors made into a skylight, double insulated. This is the upstairs bathroom. You notice that light is the same light that occurs in every middle class foyer in America. Don't put it in the foyer. Put it in a closet or in the shower, but don't put it in the foyer. Then this is imported Tuscan uh, travertine marble. It came directly out of a dumpster. <laughs> Somebody gave me a bidet, so it got a bidet. And it also got a urinal. Somebody gave me a urinal. Um, and those are all good things. Um, the city of Houston asked me to build a gazebo for their park downtown known as Discovery Green. Or Discovery Park. And uh, so we, I made it out of uh, uh, mirror and then um, 
derelict drill stem, which is a beefy pipe down in Texas. We have a lot of drillers down there. Then license plates for the roof. Um, this tree down there, known as Quad Arc or Osage Orange, uh, grows like this, very organic patterns. And so it, out, it outperforms every wood in the region, in fact, probably in the country. The reason it isn't exploited is that it grows like this. And so you don't get planks, you get pieces. But it makes uh, a dandy railing, and uh, it's, the wood is beautiful. This house, uh, my wife designed, and those look like uh, shingles on the outside. Really, they're not. They're um, 2 by 4, 2 by 6, 2 by 8, 2 by 10, and 2 by 12 western red cedar, uh, two feet long. And who would put shingles on with a framing nailer? But that's what you have to do, because they're real thick. And the scenario there is down at Weyerhaeuser, which is the major purveyor of western red cedar in the region down there. Um, a contractor will come in and order 50 bundles of 2 by 4, 8 feet long, for instance, and all they have are 45. Well, they're not going to miss that order. So they take those five bundles that are 10 feet long, vut, 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 keep that guy happy and in their circle of clients, but then they have five bundles left over that are two feet long. Well, they can't sell that. So they take the value of that, average it over their $85 million inventory, every bundle goes up a penny, so it's paid for, and then they throw it away. And then, of course, I'm standing there, thank you very much. And then after a while, they realized what I was doing, and they sent it up to me by the 18 wheeler load. Up until the collapse, of the housing market, first the subprime market and then the housing market, I was getting between 8 and 12 18 wheeler loads of material a year as 18 wheeler loads. Now it's fallen down to about 2 or 3 a year. But I still get that much material. There is so much. Anyway, that wall there is uh, 18 inches thick, an absolute bastion against the, uh, the Texas sun. And it's no fun be in Texas in August in the afternoon. Um, this is uh, the, <coughs> excuse me, uh, these are plates. You go to the tax office and say, can I have some, some of the return plates? And they'll say, yeah, help yourself. Well, great. Uh, just that coating is going to last 15 or 20 years. And it's also reflective. In Texas, that's a big deal in the summer. Then you get down to that beefy galvanized metal, that's a 75-year roof for free. And if a shingle gets boogered up, you go to a, a junkyard. <laughs> Done. Probably the best roof in Huntsville. Then uh, is that mosaic down out of bottle caps on uh, the front porch of that house. More steel goes into bottle caps annually than American automobiles. And that steel's gone forever, forever. Nobody saves bottle caps. It's like, well, it makes dandy mosaics, it makes floors, it makes a number of things. Anyway, I said, okay, guys, uh, I want a pattern. Here's the staple gun. Here's another one. I want a pattern. I don't want a drug-related pattern or skull and crossbones, but I want a pattern. Well, Dan, I just don't think I can do that. I've never done that before. Yeah, you can do it. Well, I just don't oh. Wow, when you put people in touch with who they are, look at what you get. And when these guys join my crew, they are raw. You have to peel off layers of accumulated East Texas machismo <laughs> to get down to the real person. But if you put them in touch with their feminine side, we don't put it that way, but that's what's happening. <laughs> look at what you get. Uh, this is a composite of every house I saw in any storybook as a child. Has a little cat slide roof over the front door, little eyebrow dormer up there, diamond windows, it's timber frame. Uh, there are trusses, and I put applique on the bottom and top of the trusses um, to make it look like the raft, what otherwise would have been the rafters had sagged over 300 years. Uh, and then a diminishing applique going into the center of the roof to make it look like whatever otherwise would have been the ridge board had sagged over 300 years. Those uh, black shingles are architect shingles, about a 35-year roof. Um, those colored shingles are mobile home shingles, which is about a 90-day roof. Uh, 
woven in there to make it look like a thatch roof. There we go. There's uh, the timber frame construction inside. Um, somebody gave me a leaded glass panel. We built the house around that. Uh, there's one of the diamond windows that we, uh, we had to make. We ran short. Contractors come in and say, oh, I see you had to make your own window there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A little girl on my crew made that. <laughs> a girl made that? Yeah. Well, a girl made that? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the, the rabbits on uh, the mullions don't really know, blah, 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 throw rocks, jab, poke. What he should have said is, wow. That's not a simple piece of joinery. Uh, there's a, a door. We have Dutch doors in and throughout. You can see where that's the top half, and it's a, a wine bottle butt window. Uh, this is a little house that's intended to simulate one of those Charleston cottages houses. And that grill work there was headed to the landfill. It's 1930s grill work uh, from New Orleans. Whew. Pricey, Dan, you want this stuff? It's going to the dump tomorrow. Yeah, I'd like to have that. Wow. Uh, there it is. Now uh, we've got matching panels um, on the balcony and on the back of the deck. Um, this is a parquet floor. Those are uh, four by six uh, western red cedar. And you, there's a chop saw, what is known as a chop saw. I guess that gritty name because you do this chopping motion. It's a miter saw. You take a, a, a two foot piece of four by six western red cedar and go zing, zing. You have to make that noise with your mouth. You get all these wafers. Then you glue it to the floor. Then you put in the little ceramic surprises there, grout it and seal it, and you have a parquet floor for, oh, about $25. Uh, this is a wine cork floor. Just put the word out. Here come the wine corks. Uh, I've had little ladies come up with three corks and say, I brought you some corks. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> And then others who would bring in a whole bucket full and say, don't tell anybody where you got these. <laughs> but it's kind of like a Dr. Scholl's floor. Um, and you get bragging rights. You can say, that's uh, my imported Mediterranean oak floor, because coal comes from the Mediterranean oak. Or you can say, uh, that's the uh, Chateau Petrus, 1953. <laughs> we had that with pork rinds. <laughs> Then I built a tree house. Anybody who doesn't like a tree house, any tree house, most certainly had a bleak childhood, always wanted to build a tree house. So I built it in a broad arc or Osage orange tree. It's still just as healthy as when I put it in, put it up there. Um, and so even if the tree dies, it's still gonna be there for 75 years because the wood doesn't rot and termites don't eat it. And it's maybe 85% recycled materials, 35 feet above Town Creek. Uh, a joint. This is uh, the tree house is a residence studio combination targeting artists. So the artist lives in the tree house and then there's a studio where uh, they can do their work. And every community wants artists, but they want them to, to live over there. They don't want to tolerate the mess and the aberrant behavior. Well, we're going to change that. We'll put it right in the center of town. That's what this is. And those, uh, those windows there are relish plates. You just uh, put the word out and here they come. Um, and they're vastly more successful as windows than covered with relish because when they're covered with pickles, you don't see the plate. And I don't have anything against pickles, I like pickles. But they're vastly more successful as windows. Uh, there they are back there. And this is looking from the tree house into the studio. Um, this is the inside on the studio. Those are frame samples from frame shops. And uh, when they rotate their inventory, they just throw those things away. And of course, I'm standing there. Thank you very much. Uh, and so it's kind of like a new age Rococo up there. There's a lot of legitimate gold and silver leaf. And then that's uh, a crepe myrtle balustrade, which is a local wood down there. Uh, this is the, uh, we have a, a boat arc uh, uh, railing up there, which is very organic shapes. And then artists generally don't have, they're, they're pretty benign, they don't have parties. But should they happen to have a party, uh, there would be a place where they could have one. Uh, this is a longleaf pine floor in another little house. 
uh, looks. And these materials, when they arrive, are pretty junky looking. They smell, they're dirty, they have nails. But what you can do is tidy those things up, and then you get a long leaf pine floor. Uh, this is a boat art counter. Uh, and you could throw an engine block up there if you wanted. Uh, there's a bottle cap floor, and uh, sure enough, you have that kind of clinky little feel. You get blink, blink, and I go. Uh, I built uh, another resident studio combination using a lot of bone. I call it the bone house. And in Texas, every rancher has a bone yard. Because when a cow dies, they drag it to the back 40, and five years later, there's a pile of bone. Can I raid your bone pile? Yeah, help yourself. Well, the only difference between bone and ivory is that ivory is illegal and bone is free. <laughs> and I love those primitive condyles. And so there's a lot of bone in this house. That's the studio. Uh, there's the door. Uh, those, that's glass glued to a number of, uh, of those, van uh, those uh, vanity cabinet shelves. I've got a whole pile of those, so I glued glass, or one of my crew glued glass to that and then grouted it, a little stained glass. Uh, made a little uh, set of patio furniture out of bone. <laughs> and those are surprisingly comfortable. Um, then we have wooden shards on the, the kitchen floor there. Just uh, take a two by four and your chop saw and make little uh, wafers and then slam it with a hammer and then glue it to the floor and then you get this marvelous pattern. Um, there's the countertop. Those are all rib bones and they uh, spill up onto the backsplash with uh, uh, broken mirror and so forth. And I let my crew break the mirror because it's seven years bad luck. <laughs> then I built an office building for a local recycler and uh, the deal was uh, he had no dominion over the design. He had to pay all the bills. And if he wasn't happy with what he got, oh well. So, that's the office building. His logo is on the side of his truck. It's Uncle Sam holding a beer can, saying, I want your can. <laughs> so we put that, uh, we have uh, uh, kind of this profile on the roof that, uh, kind of swoops that way, sort of like somebody went like that on a building and it... <laughs> then that is the logo again on the back of the building. Uh, T.J. Burdett and Sons Recycling, I Want Your Can. And he's holding a beer cake in that case. Then inside, uh, a company in Fort Worth gave me as much granite as I want until I die. I just have to get it by the 18 liter load. It's fine. So I have... I, get granite, more granite than you can possibly imagine. So we put a, a granite uh, mosaic floor and then a granite stack wall there with little uh, uh, stained glass surprises in there. And there are more pictures on my website. Um, if you, and I'll be showing some other pictures later on today. But in order to find out how I'm able to do what I do, you have to understand the costs of waste in the building industry. And the first is probably buried in our DNA somewhere, in that human beings have a need for maintaining consistency of our data banks. That is, for every perception we have, it has to tally with the one like it before. Otherwise, we become confused and demented and disoriented and so forth. So, I can show you an object you've never seen before, and go, oh, I know what that is, that's, that's a cell phone. You've never seen this one before. And it was one of those that were manufactured in 1875. It still works. <laughs> and what you're doing is sizing up the structural features and that pattern of structural features going through your data bank and going, oh, cell phone. But if I took a bite out of it, you go, wait a second. That's not a cell phone. That's one of those new chocolate cell phones. And you'd have to start a new category right between chocolate and cell phones. That's how we learn. <laughs> So, translate that to the building industry. We have a wall of window panes and one is cracked. We go, oh dear, that's cracked. Let's take it out, throw it away, so nobody can use it, because after all, that's what we do with a cracked window. Never mind that it doesn't affect our lives at all. It only rattles that expected unity of structural features. However, we took a small hammer 
and we added cracks to all the other windows, then we have a pattern. And just all psychology emphasizes recognition of pattern over parts that comprise a pattern. Ooh, that's kind of nice. That is, repetition creates a pattern. Now, that creates a lot of waste in the building industry. If something's cracked, dumpster, landfill, oops, blemish, dumpster. Leon, take that down, throw it away, dumpster. Well, repetition allows me to use anything. It doesn't make any difference. If I have 100 of these and 100 of those, I have the possibility of a pattern. It doesn't make any difference what these and those are. If I can repeat anything, I have the possibility of a pattern. And you don't just put them together. You have to tie into other human things. You recognize that. Now I'm going to give you the same information without the rhythm. Flattens that out, doesn't it? Every event, every human interaction, Everything that happens in the world has a signature rhythm that describes that. Every teacher recognizes the rhythm and dynamic of a shouting match that's going to lead to a fist fight, even though it's around the corner in the hallway. Oops, gotta go. Something's going on around here. Or, hmm, sounds like rain. Wow, that, that sounds like a crash. And these rhythms don't come to you in tidy two, four, three, or four, and four, four meter. They're wild constellations, mixed meter, and syncopation, little condenses tossed in every now and then. Extremely organic. And we read those. Those go directly into our data banks. And if you embody those rhythms in the parts that you're repeating, bottle caps, branches, broken mirror, hickory nuts. It doesn't make any difference. If you embody those rhythms in what you're doing, then you poke at those deeper sensibilities that are in all of us. They're deep deposits of human experience. That's how I'm able to widen the field of my free building materials. Bottle caps, hickory nuts, broken tile, glass, branches. It doesn't make any difference. If you go into Home Depot and say, I'm, I'm looking for the wine corks, where are the wine corks? Security. <laughs> that creates a lot of waste. Second thing, Friedrich Nietzsche, long about 1872, wrote a book titled The Birth of Tragedy. And in there, he talked about, he talked about uh, cultures as swinging between one of two perspectives. On the one hand, he named one perspective after the Greek god Apollo, or the Apollonian perspective, which is very crisp and tidy and intellectualized and calculated and perfect. On the other hand, we have the Dionysian perspective, which is more given to the passions and intuition and tolerant of organic texture and human gesture. So, the way the Apollonian personality hangs the picture is they get out of transit and a laser level and a micrometer. Okay, honey, thousands of an inch to the left. That's where we want the picture, right there. Predicated on plumb level, square center, and symmetrical. The Dionysian personality takes the picture and goes. That's the difference. We're accessing two different substrates for judgment. On the one hand, we have a model of plumb level, square centered, and symmetrical. On the other, we're going down to those parts of ourselves, those terrifying parts of ourselves, where there are no recipes, no precedents, or strategies, or manuals, and we're accessing instincts and sensibilities. Does it feel right? That's in all of us. You don't have to be Dan to do this. You don't have to be an artist to do this. Anybody can do this. All you have to do is go to those parts of yourself that nobody likes to go to and listen to primal murmurs. But that creates a lot of waste.
because we have an Apollonian strain in the building industry. Oh, Leon, there's a blemish. Take that off, throw it away. Oh, not squared. Oh, this, oh, that. My, oh, my. If you spent $65,000 on a new Jaguar, and it was delivered with a scratch in the door, you'd go, wait a second. <laughs> I just spent $65,000 on that. I don't want a scratch in the door. Well, never mind that it doesn't affect our lives at all. It only rattles that Apollonian mindset and bruises our vanity a little bit. That's all of us. And we demand an Apollonian model in the building industry. That exacerbates this, this cycle. The third thing is arguably the Industrial Revolution had its roots during the Renaissance with the advent of humanism. Then along came the French Revolution and gave a little punch to the middle class and the jump start to the revolution by the middle of the 19th century. It is in full flower. We're making contraption gizmos and dumaflages and machines that will do anything that up to that point had to be done by hand. Wow, how'd you get 20 of those? In the time I can only do one and they're all so perfect. Ah, you've got a machine. Here we have this machine controlling everything all the way up to today. So now the ex expectation is that something isn't good enough unless it has a machine-made appearance. It has to be perfect. Wow. Well, the simple truth is when you stay in a five-star hotel, you don't sleep on brand new sheets. Well, we can launder building materials just as easily. The scratch and dent uh, companies that you have around and there's a little ding in, in a brand new, brand new washer. It was rejected because it has a ding in it. We can still call it new. Can we? Well, we have to make that decision. Does a ding really affect our lives? Sometime, if you have the nerve, go up to one of those McMansion job sites and look in the dumpster. It'll make you ill. It'll make you sick what's in there. But no builder's garage is big enough to store the things that should not be thrown away. They grieve about it. And you'll be confronted, I promise, because they're not proud of that. And when you're confronted, you say, oh, I just thought I lost my watch. I remember now, it's on my nightstand. And then you leave, because they don't like that. They don't like people to know how much they're throwing away. It's amazing, it's astonishing, it's numbing. That creates a lot of waste. Standard materials are a good thing. We love, I mean, Honey, the light bulb is burnt out. Go get another one. I get one, and it fits. We love standard materials. But the downside, if something isn't standard, goes to the landfill. And trees don't grow two inches by four inches, eight, 10, and 12 feet tall. We create mountains of waste just achieving the humble two by four. And those guys in the forest are doing a pretty good job of dispatching the the byproduct of their industry into particle board and OSB and laminated veneer lumber and so forth and so on. But it does no good to be responsible at the point of harvest in the forest if consumers are wasting the harvest at the point of consumption. And that's what's happening. If a 2 by 4 has a little warp to it, you can take it back. I'm so sorry, sir. Here, let's throw that away. Here's a straight one. Well, if you wanted to go get a bunch of warped two by fours, you can't go get them. I mean, I would get them. I love that. Nope, they go into the dumpster, they become mulch. There's a lot of waste to get. Fifth, fourth thing is that notion that labor is disproportionately more expensive than materials. Well, let me tell you a little story. Jim Tullis, the guy I trained, said, Jim, got a job lined up for you. Gonna be foreman on a framing crew. Well, 
damn, I just, I just don't think I'm ready. Yeah, you're ready. You're ready. Well, damn, I just, oh. So we hired him. He was out there on the job site with a tape measure looking for header material in the trash heap, which is the board that goes over a door. And the superintendent drove up and said, Tulks, what are you doing? Oh, just looking for some header material. <laughs> sort of waiting to get a raise on the spot, because that's what I taught him to do. He said, no, no, I'm not paying you to go through the trash. Go get another one, get back to work. And he had the nerve and the wherewithal to say, you know, if you were paying me $300 an hour, I can see how you might say that. But right now, I'm saving you $5 a minute. Do the math. Good call, Tullus. From now on, the rest of you guys hit this pile first. Well, once in a while, you get access to the control room and you can kind of mess with the dials there a little bit. That's what happened there. It doesn't happen very often. But it happened there. There is this widespread assumption that it's not cost efficient to pay your $25 an hour carpenter to pull nails. Ooh, do the math. And the, the irony is that he wasn't very good at math. <laughs> the next thing is maybe Plato is still having his way with us in his notion of perfect forms. He said that we have an idea or in our head the perfect vision of what we want, the mind's eye view. And we force all of our resources to accommodate that idea, that predetermined idea. So we all have in our head the American dream, the dream house. The American dream is a house. The problem is we can't afford it. So we have the American dream look-alike, which is a mobile home. Now there's a blight on the planet. First of all, it's a chattel mortgage, just like furniture, just like a car. As soon as you write the check, it depreciates 30%. Then after a year, you can't get insurance on everything you have in it. It outgusts formaldehyde so much so that there's a federal law in place to warn mobile home buyers of the formaldehyde atmosphere danger. You all might have crown molding, but it's vinyl covered foam crown molding. Wired with 14 gauge wire, nothing wrong with that as long as you don't ask 14 gauge wire to do what 12 gauge wire is supposed to do. And that's what happens. When they burn down, they burn down. The walls are this thick. They have the structural value of corn. Oh, I thought there was a mobile home park over there. No, we had a wind last night. It's gone now. Then when they degrade, what do you do with them? You're better off under a bridge. That's America's answer to housing for the poor. Then, all the vendors, all the carpenters, all the tradesmen, the licensed uh, professionals, uh, engineers, architects, real estate folks, planning and zoning, right back to the consumer. Everybody thinks this way. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And you can't break out of it unless you have a good bit of nerve. Then here come the advertisers and marketeers, and they are good. They will sell you something you didn't know you needed. Oh, wow. He said, we need those windows. Let's, honey, let's throw ours away so nobody can use them and buy those. New windows will save you some money. My, oh, my. They're very, very good. That exacerbates this self-fulfilling cycle that you can't get out of. Then Jean-Paul Sartre wrote a book titled Being and Nothingness. It's a pretty quick read. Probably snapped through it in two years, three to eight hours a day with a good breakfast. Kind of like reading the Minneapolis phone book. Anyway, in there, he talked about he said that he developed what has come to be known as the divided self. And he said that human beings act differently when they know they're alone than when somebody else is around. So if I know I'm alone and I'm eating spaghetti, I can eat like a backhoe. I can, 
I can wipe my mouth on my sleeve, chew with my mouth open, make little noises, scratch wherever I want. But as soon as you walk in, ooh, spaghetti sauce here, napkin in the lap, chew with my mouth closed, no noises, no scratching. And what I'm doing is fulfilling your expectation for how I should behave. I'm fulfilling your expectation for how I should lead my life. I was leading my life the way I wanted to before you barged in. But as soon as you come in, I accommodate that expectation. I notice all of you are sitting one person to a chair. You could have said, you know, your lap looks a little bit more comfortable than these chairs. Do you mind if I sit in your lap? But all your shoes match. Sure enough, that pressure is out there all the time and there are expectations and sometimes there are formalized expectations, as in homeowners associations. Sometimes those guys are Nazis. You want to paint your front door blue? Ooh, you need to go through the design committee. Ooh, no. And design by committee means that you end up with beige because that's the only color a committee can agree upon with all the compromises. We can't even agree on beige in the legislature. <laughs> we don't even get to beige. Well, when you buy into those restrictions, you're giving up a lot. That exacerbates this whole thing. Then, human beings are gregarious in that we're a social species. We like to hang together in groups. So if I want to be identified with that group over there, I do what they do. You see this in junior high a lot. They'll save all summer, those kids, get a pair of designer jeans. So that come September, they can stride in. I'm important today. Don't touch my designer jeans. I'm one of the beautiful people. I see you're not. <laughs> That's reason enough right there to have uniforms in schools. But that happens in the building industry as well. We want to be one of the beautiful people. So every one of our houses has a room in it that we use three times a year. The rest of the year, we use that room to store newspapers and bills and car keys. On and on and on and on. Then Abraham Maslow, who is a hot dog psychologist in, during World War II, he asked the question, what motivates human beings? And he came up with this hierarchy of needs. It's a, a tier thing. The first tier are basic needs. Uh, food, clothing, shelter, homeostasis, that sort of thing. Once we solve that, the second tier of needs is to protect that first tier. So security, safety, that sort of thing. Then once we've solved that, we start thinking, hmm, start craving community. I want to belong. So we, we start craving family connections and groups and so forth. Then once we're part of a group, we start thinking, you know, I'm pretty important. I think I'd like to have a little bit of status. So we start fluttering vanity. And what's happened is that we've taken vanity and shoved it down here in the first tier. And we're making basic life decisions predicated on vain cravings. Ooh, I want a three-bedroom, two-bath house, even though I'm single. Ooh, there isn't such a thing as a starter home anymore. All the geriatric set know what I'm talking about. You young guys don't even know what a starter home is. Used to be, you buy a starter home, it's one bedroom, one bath. And it's the size of this stage. Oh, maybe this is a little bit large. And then 
as you get bigger and have more resources, you jump up to a bigger house. But right here, right now, that's what you get. That worked for a long time until William Levitt came along and we start booming out housing for the people coming back from World War II and it just got out of control. And now, the starter house is a three bedroom, two bath house that is at least 1,800 square feet. All those things, I do the opposite. And there are Apollonian parts of me you know, there are standardized things. I, I can't violate the laws of physics or the building codes, but every building code has a provision that alternative materials are allowed provided you fulfill the intent of the code. Well, that's easy. The house grows out of the material. The design of the house grows out of the materials I have. In mainstream building industry, you start off with plans then you go to the lumber company and the suppliers and get those materials. I start off with a pile of stuff and develop the plans. So a change order in the world of Dan takes about six seconds. I think I'd like to have a window right there. A change order everywhere else takes six hours, six days, six weeks, six months, because you're going through all these functionaries and this committee that ends up with beige. Now what we can do is dig our heels in and say, no, no more. I'm not going to go along with Apollonian, Platonic, standardized strategies imposed on us by the pressures of a culture. But I'm going to dive into the most terrifying parts of myself and discover who I really am. And that is thrilling indeed. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. Uh, keep in mind that I'm deaf as a post. And so if you don't give it a little bit of diaphragm, we have to go through Phil. <laughs> Any questions? I'm happy to bring the mic around. Right here first. How did you get like this? <laughs> I mean, you know, you, well, you grew up in an Apollonian society. What happened? Well, I, I grew uh, The question was, how did I become who I am? And I grew up um, in a fairly rural community. We had a cow and chickens and um, so forth and garden. And we always made do with what we had. So there was a little part of that. Back in the early days, you get to go to the dump and everything is free. You pick it, it's like going to a candy store where everything is free. Go, oh, I can use this. And you go back with more than you brought to the dump. And that's always been a part of me and I've Everybody wants to be a builder, and I'm no different. And so I'd always suspected that you could build a whole house out of what it went into the landfill. And sure enough, it's true. I believe there was a question back there. You have to store your materials. He just has a, he'd like to do this, but he has a small space. That's perennially a problem. I've been at this for, <coughs> excuse me, 12 years, and uh, I started networking, but I stopped networking three months into this because I was being overwhelmed. Yahoo, we don't have to take this to the landfill, let's send it to Dan. Here it came. And so that was a problem, it took me five years to recover from that. Eventually I brokered a deal with the city to put, uh, put together a warehouse where I could take my overage because I can only use 5 to 15 percent of what I get. And then the rest, I could just get too much. So I take it to that warehouse, it's distributed to nonprofit organizations and low-income families. 
uh, and I'm in the for-profit sector. Uh, I'm about as non-profit as you can get and still be in the for-profit sector. <laughs> but uh, if I put something in there, I can't get it back out. So, if you're a small guy, you can't go to a wholesaler and cherry pick. You got to take it all, or you don't get anything. They can't because mosquitoes are buzzing around those folks all the time. So what you're stuck with is keeping your eye on Craigslist or Free Cycle, getting the word out. I need. Uh, I'm looking for a kitchen sink. I'm looking for a door. And when these things come come forward, then you store those knowing that that's the object you need. So it's a problem unless you have some extra space. Uh, time for a couple more questions, but I want to point out, I know some people are taking off. Take your programs with you. We've tried to honor Dan's ideas about recycling and reusing. There are instructions on your program for how to make an origami phoenix. This only took me three tries, but you'll probably get it faster. And if you make an origami phoenix and put your Augsburg email address on the tail of the phoenix and bring it to Memorial 111, we're going to have a drawing at, to win a book about Dan's work. So keep the program or take a couple of programs with you for practice uh, and recycle your program yet again. You'll see they've already been recycled. We just grabbed a bunch of paper out of the recycling bin. So some of you probably have the study key for the Psych 100 exam. I don't know what's on the back of these. Uh, but there's all sorts of different stuff. Another question, I saw somebody with a question over here. Sorry. On average, how much money do you spend on each house that you build? Um, well, it's difficult to say. Um, the question is, how much money do I spend on each house? I'm building for about 30 uh, to $40 a square foot. And I only pay my unskilled workers minimum wage. But they get a fire hose of information. Because it takes a little bit more time to use recycled materials therefore more labor, so I've got a low-cost labor force and then free materials. So it works out. The only way I can get this model to work is if it's also a training platform for unskilled workers. And so, and I also go small. You know, I don't build, I just don't build 1,300, 1,800 square foot houses. I started off building one at 1,400 square feet and thought, oh boy, I can do whatever I want. Built a Budweiser house, 2,000 square feet. I'll never do that again. Then back down to 1,200, then to 1,000. And now I will never build anything more than 1,000 square feet. Often enough, they're 300 to 500 square feet. And so it's hard to say how much I spend because generally the bank wants some sort of a budget. And I have to go through the bank. Uh, so I cut my budget as though I were building a conventional house, knowing that I'm going to be laughably below, laughably within budget. You know, I just I never use the rest of the budget money because I'm finished. But just in case, and that's what the bank wants to see. Institute. Institutions love things to uh, look nice. How do you influence institutional life? For instance, we have matching chairs in the chapel. Um, when new buildings are built, they tend to look like the building next to it. Um, any advice? I apologize, I just didn't understand your question. So people like things that match. And the example is the chairs in the chapel all look the same. They don't necessarily have to, but how do you deal with institutions that have this matching mentality? Well, if I'm asked by an institution, I don't give them an option. Like with the, um, uh, the office building that I built. The deal was, I'm in charge. If you don't like it, too bad. And you pay all the bills. And in my own life, uh, my wife and I like Cabernet. We like top shelf Cabernet. But we go to the antique shops and buy the onesies. Well, there's just one. You don't get the whole set of stemware. You just get one. So we have all this beautiful crystal ware that we've paid five, eight, ten bucks a piece for, not 140 a piece. 
And so that is part of the Apollonian mindset, that everything has to match. I built uh, an education center for a recycling corporation known as Waste Management. Do you have Waste Management up here? Uh, that company? Okay. Built an education center for them. And I built, uh, or my crew and I built, uh, 40 chairs that were recycled chairs, and every one was different. And same deal. If you don't like what I do, then don't hire me to begin with. But I'm in charge, and every one of the chairs is going to be different. And how much fun is that? One is a tire chair, one is made out of glass, one made out of wine corks, bottle caps, branches. Ooh, I want the tire chair. No, I want it. Oh, get back. I was here for, you know, that sort of thing. And so if we start cultivating that taste for variety and organic quality in our lives, it's thrilling just how wonderful that is. And it would, it would work in this room you would be surprised. I'm sure you couldn't get the upper ups to agree to that. But if we replaced every one of these chairs with uh, 75 different chairs, or 150, 300, people would love to come here just to sit in that chair or that one, or just to look at them. You'd be surprised. But it's one of those walls that are hard to crack. My mission is to keep stuff out of the landfill. And so those are other, we're all part of the same choir, but those are voices for other singers. My, my voice is to keep stuff out of the landfill. And so I'm aware of a lot of that, but I don't use it. I try to make things work with trash. Try to. Did that answer your question? Thank you. For Dan, thank you very much. <laughs>